And we're joined by Eric Van Nordstrand. He's a U.S. interest rate strategist at Credit Suisse. And so I imagine that you agree with someone like Robert Mundell, who says, look, it would help Europe, the Europeans, if we saw more Fed action then, right? Well, that makes sense. And that's definitely something we think we're going to see out of the Fed in the coming months. One holiday, Fed, one holiday gift the Fed might be giving to the markets in the coming months is that we expect them to institute a policy of QE3, where they're back in the market creating bank reserves and buying U.S. mortgages, U.S. Wait, Treasury debt. Like the debt. first half of the year? Or? Probably in the first quarter of the year. We think oh. it's something that's really on the horizon. Why? There's, the data's been better than expected out yeah. of the United States. Exactly. The U.S. data has been fantastic. And historically, the U.S. data has been a fantastic predictor of U.S. interest rates and the U.S. And US risk assets. Mm -hmm. But those relationships have starkly decoupled in the past couple months. And the reason is our friends across the pond in Europe is that the, the bad risk sentiment that's coming out of Europe has infected the U.S. markets in keeping rates low, keeping risk, ass, risk assets in a tough position. Right. And that's why we think the Fed's going to step in. But, you know, but as, to Sarah's point, if you've got an economic recovery here underway, you know, the jobless rate is coming down here in the United States. If you've got a Fed then that moves and, and, and does a QE3, doesn't that undermine its credibility, though? Well, we think what the Fed needs to consider is a cost-benefit analysis of the actions it takes. And the, the theoretical cost of the Fed stepping in and buying more treasuries, buying more mortgages, is inflation. And we're at a point now, given the bad risk sentiment coming out of Europe, given the low level of interest rates here, that inflation expectations don't seem to be very high. So it's a, little bit of a, it's a little bit of a gift for the Fed. They have a little bit more wiggle room hmm. to help ease the economy further, help get this tenuous recovery going without incurring it's a ton like of a costs Goldilocks up front. It's kind of scenario for them to do this. Then. Exactly. Okay. They, they have a little bit of wiggle room to try even harder to keep the economic uh, to keep It the might not be a credibility easier. issue, but certainly it's going to be a political hot potato. The Republicans are going to get all charged up. It's certainly, that's certainly been an important consideration for the Fed. Now, historically, the Fed's an independent monetary body, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. They're allowed to make their decisions for the good of the economy without having to worry about what it looks like, without political posturing. We've seen a change in that in, re in recent years, as the Fed's been more a target of, of political attacks. You know, you've heard, right. you've heard people criticizing Fed actions um, from the political pulpit. But it's not going to affect the decision. It shouldn't, and we certainly hope that the Fed's able to remain independent. That said, these, these threats are a dangerous thing, and the Fed will need to, be, will need to keep close watch on the political landscape as right, well. And thus, that's why you've seen Bernanke and others come out. They're much more transparent about what goes on at the Fed to alleviate you know, maybe some of these public concerns. But let me get back to coordination um, and, and what the Fed could do with the European Central Bank and others as we head into the new year to try to sort of you know, restore some confidence in the markets. Well, the, the quantitative easing that the Fed has been doing and we expect will continue to do domestically is one of the policies that many in the market are really looking to the European Central Bank to do to help fix the conditions over there and for a slightly different reason. They want the European Central Bank to come in and buy the sovereign debt of some of these peripheral nations. And Robert Mundell says they will, by the way. Well, <laughs> that, that the ECB very well. We, um, we certainly hope so. We think it would be a positive for the market. That said, President Draghi, the, the European counterpart of Ben Bernanke, was pretty clear last time around that it's not something that's immediately on the horizon, at least not without some sort of fiscal give back. From, from the European nations. Now, they, we've started to see a little bit of that, so we're hopeful, but we'll have to keep a close eye on Frankfurt as and, these things progress. Mandel would say that, though, because he, he wants to keep the very euro that he created, right? True, <laughs> and uh, it is in his interest for sure. But what an interesting point that he made is that last week's auction was a really big deal, and it was a backdoor QE, and he interpreted it as a signal that the ECB would be prepared to do more aggressive quantitative easing. Well, for the signals, we, we, tend to, we tend to prefer to watch directly what President Draghi is coming out and saying. And he has, he has made some light comments in the past that says, you know, he's not, he's not what we might call an inflationista who's totally opposed to any form of QE in any form whatsoever. He just wants to see a lot of preconditions for this. He wants to see some fiscal cleanup in the European nations, which is exactly the sort of problem that got us into this mess. Right. Um, the question is whether what the European policymakers, the elected policymakers, will do will be enough to do that. Well, we are back with Eric Van Nordstrand. He's the U.S. interest rate strategist at Credit Suisse. And Eric, uh, let me just talk to you a bit about, uh, obviously, where interest rates are headed for next year, and I presume even lower, given what you've been talking about with QE3. That's right. We think, in our base case scenario, we expect the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, currently at about 2% flat, to rally another 50 basis points down to 1.5%. Wow. Yeah, 1. we think 5%. that's... 1.5%. 1.5%. It'd be a new all-time low. And we think that that's due to, re 
due to a number of factors, both macroeconomic and technical, um, especially coming out of Europe and even some coming out of Washington that should be keeping rates low going into Q1. What out of Washington? What do you mean? Well, the Fed will be the first the thing, okay. first and foremost. So that's QE3, the Fed coming in to buy more mortgages, buy more treasuries. Um, the idea is to support the economy and keep, keep rates low. And that's one of the reasons we think that uh, treasuries will continue to be a strong asset in the uh, Q1. Explain to me how regulatory reform is also going to keep interest rates low. That's right. Well, in, some, in certain aspects of regulatory reform, both domestic and foreign, banks are being asked to hold more capital and more expensive types of capital, which increases the cost of borrowing to banks um, and, and unfortunately precludes investment in risk assets, it precludes economic investment. Um, which tends to be a retardant on the growth of the economy and the surge in risk assets. Mm. That keeps people's money in safe assets and keeps rates low. Okay, so if we've got rates this low then, I, I, I can imagine a few scenarios perhaps. Uh, number one, more stalemate in Washington, no incentive at all to take care of the federal deficit, is that right? Well, the, the, I mean, one silver lining of this situation is that it is very cheap to finance the federal yes. deficit right now. Um, so there are certainly some who argue that now is a good time to borrow despite the, the, despite the size of the deficit because right. rates are so low. Okay. Uh, what, about, what about the impact on the economy? Well, the Fed, uh, when the Fed eases, when the Fed lowers rates or does QE, the goal is to stimulate the economy by lowering borrowing costs. It's effectively credit easing, letting people borrow money easier. Right. The fact is that every time the Fed does, does that, every time the Fed introduces an unconventional easing policy like QE, like Operation Twist, which they're doing now, they experience a little bit of diminishing marginal return. Mm. So we still think Operation Twist, QE3 are helping on the margin and probably makes sense from the Fed's cost-benefit analysis of what they can do, they're not what's going to be saving the world. Right, so the lower they go, the, re the, the return on that is not as much as, as basically essentially the first time we've seen these easings, right? Exactly. The biggest example of that is when they lowered the Fed funds rate effectively to zero. They can't lower it anymore, so that's why they've had to resort to these unconventional policy tools like QE. Okay, Eric, thank you very much for stopping by, giving us your predictions for 2012.